Hello, I'm Donrich Thaldar. The topic of this video is the raised nullius construction of human genomic data. No one branch of the law holds exclusive sway over human genomic data. Instead, multiple branches, including property law, privacy law, contract law, and intellectual property law, are all applicable. This opens the door for different persons to have rights originating in different branches of the law with respect to the same genomic data. To determine who has rights with respect to a particular person's genomic data, the rules of each relevant branch of the law must be applied. The application of these rules to genomic data may be relatively straightforward in some branches of the law, but in property law, which is relevant to determining ownership of genomic data, it is often more complicated. Only a handful of jurisdictions have specifically legislated on the ownership of genomic data. In the absence of such specific legislation that provides who owns genomic data, general property law rules must be applied. In common law legal systems and some le mixed legal systems where legislation is absent, this would entail resorting to the jurisdiction's common law. However, given the novelty of applying property law rules to genomic data, it is not always obvious which of the general rules would apply. In this video, I will share some of my research group's thinking in this regard. Although it is based on South African law, many of the principles are shared with other legal systems. A helpful start is to consider the genesis of genomic data as a legal object. There is genetic information, that is, facts about heredity, encoded in the DNA of every cell in the human body. However, in its natural form, that is, encoded in DNA, genetic information is neither capable of human control nor useful in any conscious human activity. Accordingly, Genetic information locked up in DNA does not qualify as a legal object. It is only when DNA is sequenced and genomic data are generated, that is, when facts are collected for analysis and stored digitally, that there is something, a data instance, that is capable of human control and useful in conscious human activity, such as genomics research. It is at this point that a legal object comes into being. And to reiterate, because we can control computer files, we can own them. They are di digital property and often quite valuable. As genomic data are newly generated, an original mode of acquisition of ownership must apply. There are only two original modes of acquisition that are potentially relevant to genomic data, namely acquisition of fruit, which would view genomic data as the fruit of DNA, and acquisition of a res nullius, which would view genomic data as a res nullius that can be acquired by whoever first takes effective control of it with the intention of being the owner. Can genomic data be viewed as the fruit of DNA? I suggest not. In property law theory, the fruit bearing object is not only a necessary antecedent of the fruit, it must produce the fruit. It seems contrived to suggest that DNA somehow produces a genomic data. More aptly, DNA is being described by genomic data. 
Accordingly, the construction of genomic data as the fruit of DNA does not fit well with property law theory. Would the solution be to construct genomic data as the fruit of something other than DNA? This is an interesting possibility, but also problematic as genomic data are generated by a sequencing process that makes use of a multiplicity of distinct objects, ranging from sequencers in the laboratory to cloud servers using software as a service, all of which may have different owners. By contrast, classic property law theory contemplates the fruit being produced by a singular fruit-bearing object. Also, can the objects involved in the sequencing process properly be described as themselves generating the data, analogous to an apple tree producing apples? Although much of the sequencing process is automated, the equipment and software used in the sequencing process are best conceived of as instruments in the hands of the laboratory technicians. Accordingly, it is doubtful whether construction of genomic data as fruit can theoretically be sustained. If we accept that the genomic data are generated by lab technicians, can such lab technicians have a claim to owning the data based on their labor? Investment of intellectual labor can be the ground for the vesting of rights, but only if the product falls within one of the well-defined kinds of intellectual property, such as copyrights or patents. However, genomic data, I'm referring specifically to raw sequence data, do not qualify for either copyright or patent protection. If a data set is compiled with the genomic data of various individuals, such a data set may, in certain jurisdictions, qualify for IP protection. However, this possibility in intellectual property law does not solve the property law problem of original acquisition of ownership of a newly generated genomic data instance. I should mention that the European Union is indeed considering creating a new right for data generators in the data that they generate. However, this new right will not include human genomic data. Given that the construction of genomic data as fruit has proven to be unsustainable, and given that no other mode of original acquisition of ownership offers even the superficial possibility of being applicable to genomic data, the only remaining option is that a newly minted genomic data instance belongs to no one. It is res nullius. This construction allows for original acquisition of the genomic data instance through appropriation, which requires the will to be the owner and effective control of the object. The result is quite workable. The lab technicians conducting the sequencing will be best placed to acquire ownership on behalf of their employer. But what about the person to whom the genomic data relates, often referred to as the data subject? should this person not automatically be deemed the owner of the genomic data? Well, no. Having a personal connection with an object is no legal ground for claiming any property rights in such an object. If the personal connection is of such nature that it may reasonably impact one's privacy, it may give rise to privacy rights in respect of the object, but not property rights.
In the context of informational privacy, over the past decade or two, many jurisdictions have enacted data protection statutes. And although some privacy rights may appear property-like, it does not mean that privacy, pr privacy law has been subsumed by property law. Each of these branches of the law has its own distinct theoretical foundations, structures, and rules. To illustrate with an old-fashioned example, I can get an injunction or an interdict, whatever it's called in the specific jurisdiction, against you to destroy a stockpile of pamphlets, which is your property that discloses intimate private information about me. This does not mean that my privacy is my property. It simply means that different branches of the law interact in a, in a dynamic way and that rights with a basis in one branch of the law can, depending on the jurisdiction and the circumstances, supersede rights with a basis in another branch of the law. The Reyes Nullius construction of genomic data is the only way to provide a sound legal theoretical basis for the acquisition of ownership in, genomic, in a genomic data instance. Once such a basis is established, the rights entailed by ownership can be distributed through contract. Importantly, however, certain rights in the ownership bundle are likely to be encumbered by the data subject's informational privacy rights. It is the task of smart technology lawyers to carefully delineate the extent of such encumberment. Thank you for listening, and you're very welcome to visit my research group's website at www.datalaw.africa.